an Im really important subject, and for some reason it's been brushed under the carpet. Britain risks signing away its powers over pandemic policy to unelected World Health Organization officials. This is according to members of parliament who are warning others that this needs to be sorted out. This is a pandemic treaty. It's feared this new pandemic treaty, which is currently being drawn up by the UN agency, could bounce the UK into locking down society faster during a future global health crisis. So critics are now warning that member states could be pressurised into following the agency's instructions when responding to pandemics under the treaty. This means a supranational, unelected body could well have the power to impose restrictions on this country against the wishes of our national government. What does that mean? It means they could make us have vaccine passports, they could close the borders, it also means they could impose quarantine measures as well. Well, here to shed light on that is Molly Kingsley, who's writer and co-founder of Us For Them. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me no, on. No, brilliant. Good I'm morning. delighted that you're here. Rene's, uh, Rene uh, has obviously been in contact with you and we're delighted that you're here. Could you just, I mean, I tried to summarise it there at, at the beginning. And I think what started off as, as, a, as a good piece of work by the politicians, they said, right, in the wake of COVID, we want to do something, we want to be prepared. And, and that work started when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister. It's morphed into something much, I think, more dangerous and darker. I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, a degree of international cooperation over pandemics and health issues, which do know no borders, you know, that is the reality. That clearly makes sense. However, what is being proposed, or at least what was proposed in the last drafts of the documents made available to the public, which was over a year ago, and I'll come on to that in a second, but what was proposed went far, far beyond this. Now, you're right, David, that what, what is being talked about here is a pandemic treaty. Now, that is actually technically not... Uh, entirely correct because there are two documents there's a pandemic treaty and actually that is the document that contains really the framework with provisions for this enhanced international cooperation that treaty actually in itself is not the worst offender you know there are a few concerning provisions in that agreement but it is not terrible in broad summary that go that document goes hand in hand with another set of proposals and that is amendments to international health regulations now it is this second document in which all the really scary things that you've mentioned so you know the powers that would be given to the who to impose mandatory quarantines mandatory vaccination even restrictions on travel restrictions on personal freedom also very wide censorship powers given to the who those documents are largely con contained in this second agreement there's a whole load of issues here. The first is that this agreement, the amendments to the international health regs, the last draft, as I mentioned, that was made available to parliamentarians and the public was done so over a year ago. That draft is due to be updated and voted on in rather unbelievably a month from now. So we have this crazy situation where, you know, according to the documents that were last seen by all of us and analysed by lawyers and all the rest of it, you know, with many, many serious flags in those documents which propose to do something you know, almost unheard of. They really propose to restructure the international health architecture and they're not being made available to the public. So at the very least, those of us looking closely at this issue, and you know, you're right, there are thankfully a number, small but growing contingent of MPs who are becoming alive to the threat that this poses to our national rulemaking autonomy. At the very least, these documents need to be shelved and we need to defer this process so that there is a proper time for review and scrutiny of these, these proposals. Now, as you say, there is a growing group of people, Conservative MPs and peers have written to Alicia Kearns, who's chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Uh, this is the APPG group, the all-party parliamentary group, actually, on pandemic response and recovery. They say signing up to this would be potentially the most far-reaching changes to the way public health policy will be conducted. They warn that if the new treaty and, as you say, the IHR amendments are adopted, they risk undermining UK sovereignty and allowing unaccount uh, unaccountable individuals and supranational bodies tacit jurisdiction over national public health measures. Now, I do not understand because there's another article that was written by Esther McVeigh in The Telegraph saying there's no way we would uh, cede powers to, to a supranational body. Well, 
clearly they will or might. Yeah. Yeah, and look, I mean, you know, Esther is, in my view, one of the good guys here. I think you know, I, have a I lot agree. Of yeah, I have a lot of respect for her. <clears throat> um, and she did write that piece, and I think that was intended to reassure, you know, her colleagues, probably groups like us who have been raising concerns about these documents for a while now. If that is the case, then, you know, fantastic is what I would say, but the documents need to be in the public domain. It would be almost inconceivable for a treaty that has so much scope to really set the tone of international health relations and personal freedom, you know, public spending for, for a generation, really, to not receive proper scrutiny and proper, proper you know, eyeballs on it. So the documents just have to be released. And it is possible that since the last draft of the documents, there have been significant changes that mean all the issues that we've been shouting about have gone away. Now, if that is the case, fantastic. Why not put them into the public domain? But the failure to do so is only fueling further concern. And rightly, I believe, we should be concerned. It's fascinating because there's also a piece by Lord Frost. He says the government isn't being open about what it is actually doing. He also goes on to say, as we discovered with the Rwanda plan, the doctrine of many government lawyers seems to be that international commitments are in practice just as legally binding as our own laws. So whether it's actually by the letter of the law binding or not by the letter of the law, it will be deemed by the lawyers to be binding on this, on this country. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we can't sign up to international agreements thinking, oh, well, it's not great and it looks a bit trenchant, but, you know, we'll breach it if we have to. That is not how it works. For a start, that might have impacts on our credit rating and, you know, the UK's ability to raise sovereign debt. So we, it, it's very naive to think that that is what would happen here. The other point, of course, that we've not mentioned here, and I think you alluded to it in your intro, David, is just the lack of accountability with this organization the world health organization as a whole so it is not an elected organization and although it had very very noble roots i think many of us would say that it, it has strayed far from those roots in large part actually because its funding arrangements mean that it is now to the tune of about 80 percent um funded by um specified interests so you know public public private funding that has a particular aim in mind and that means it's had a very very heavy slant towards the pharmaceutical industry it's no secret that the pharmaceutical industry is a major funder of the who for all these reasons i think we really have to treat what it's saying what it's asking us to do with a high degree of you know if not cynicism at least intellectual curiosity and as you say that has been entirely lacking from the public debate so far there has been frighteningly little on these agreements in mainstream discourse now just in terms of the timing is it just by chance they haven't released the new the new plans or or, or, or is it rather more machiavellian that they don't want the scrutiny on it I mean, look, it's very hard imputing intention, mal intention, isn't it? That's where mm. I think you, know, you get into trouble and we'll all be called conspiracy theorists. So I don't know is the honest answer, but it seems to me really quite shocking that anyone would think it was acceptable to get this near to the deadline and not release the documents. There's a really interesting point of law here, actually, and you know, I should explain for your listeners that don't know my background as a lawyer, we work very closely with a number of other lawyers. And actually the international law requirements here were that to meet the WHO's own treaty obligation, so it obligations it is bound by, it was meant to present these documents in January to the public um, and to its own constitutional committees. Now, it hasn't done that, and there is a group of jurists who have written a very strong open letter saying that actually the agreements can no longer be put before the WHA, the executive body of the World Health Organization, they can no longer be put before that body for a vote this year. So the vote is invalid. And I think our politicians would be well to take that very seriously. You know, we shouldn't be entering agreements where there are questions about the rule of law, about where there are serious procedural questions. So I think, you know, for all those reasons, at the very, very least, this vote must be deferred. It must be. Rene, what do you make? I know you you mm. were very much on the ball when it came to this. Your your thoughts? So I, as as Molly, I just worry about anything where, firstly, the blanket reply you get from politicians is, "It's fine, don't worry." 
but you're not allowed to look at anything. That worries me. I have had this debate with my MP ad infinitum and he just writes back and I'm getting the same messages now on Twitter from other people with what appears to be a cut and paste from the government you don't need to worry we will not cede our sovereignty to anyone yeah. and yet if this goes ahead as Molly says and it's passed into law even though we might not be ceding our sovereignty the very fact that it's an international agreement that we would have to break puts us in a very difficult position I'm very worried about it but as Molly maybe they've changed it I'd like to see the documents. Well, I'd like to see it, particularly as time is very pressing before it's actually passed. Mo Molly, just in terms of the response you're getting from parliamentarians, I get the sense that many of them didn't know anything about yes. this, that they're being told by whoever, uh, the whips or whatever, that, that actually this, pan this plan is a really good thing. What, what's been the response as you try and raise awareness to various politicians? Yeah, I mean, so we organised a letter gosh, probably a year ago now. And um, that was nuts for them organised, you know, letter with parliamentarians jumping on board. And it, it was, that was the first sign, actually, I think, that there were concerns in Parliament. There was then a debate held either just before or just after that. I think there are parliamentarians who are concerned, but it's a, it's a frighteningly small number so far. And I think our job, you know, all of us uh, are concerned about this and have anything of a platform on this need to be talking much much more about it but we need to be talking carefully about it because it doesn't help to couch it in very emotive language it doesn't help to attribute malintent where actually more likely it is just utter incompetence but you know i would say here the world health organization are really really not helping themselves so one of the issues and you know Rennie, you just identified it is that it's very easy for parliamentarians, MPs to dismiss these agreements in the way almost Esther has done by saying, you know, it's all OK, it's all in hand, there's no impact on sovereignty. Actually, the pandemic treaty contains provisions, the, the very first provisions of the pandemic treaty reassert national sovereignty. Now, unfortunately, that very bold and very reassuring statement is completely undercut by the substance of the international health regulations. Now, it becomes a little bit hard to read a benign intention here because if you were really, really, you know, convinced that these agreements taken together as legally they would be, if you were really sure they weren't going to infringe national sovereignty, release both agreements. And it's very noticeable that Ted Ross, the DG of the WHO, whenever he talks about the treaties and the fact they won't have any impact on sovereignty, he's very careful to couch his language only in terms of the pandemic treaty. He does not mention the IHR. So read into that what you will. They need to be released and we need to carry on talking about it. We really, really have to. Molly, really good to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh